this match. Uh, please join me in giving a warm Notre Dame welcome to Dr. Victoria Coates. Association 
in Washington in the mid-19th century and say, we have to create an art to commemorate ourselves or no one will remember what the United States stood for. So you had one of my favorites uh, is at, at the end of World War I, Claude Monet writing on Armistice Day to George Clemenceau, I want to give you two paintings for the nation because it's the only way I can participate in this great victory. So we have a very clear agency on the part of the artists, on the part of the patrons, to use these objects to celebrate democracy. Now, since we're in the United States and we're set in such an interesting political moment right now, uh, I guess interesting is as good a word as any. Ten more days. Um, uh, the painting I wanted to look at, and there is architecture, painting, and sculpture in the book, as you saw, is uh, Albert Bierstadt's Rocky Mountain Slanders Peak from 1862. And, and when I started writing the book, this was probably the chapter I dreaded the most. I don't know that much about American art. Uh, as an Italian Renaissance snob, I generally consider it craft. <laughs> uh, and I wasn't quite sure how I was going to do this, but this picture really uh, grabbed me. And it, I, in a way, it's, it's like having ten children. I love them all dearly. Uh, and none of them are my favorite, but this, this ha does have a close place to my heart because I also love the Rocky Mountains very much. Now, their shot, as you may know, One actually sort of fun thing about, about the book, just as in this, oh, we were not supposed to do that. I tried to take that auto <coughs> forward off. I may have failed. Uh, which is one of the great things about our history now is rather than having somebody saying, next slide forward, you know, <laughs> please go back to, oh my gosh, caught on fire, um, <laughs> that we have this digital ability to create these PowerPoints. And also, in terms of publishing, to scatter 175 color illustrations, this was unheard of 10 years ago. And so our, our technological advances have been really a wonderful thing for our <coughs> uh, But the two key figures in this chapter, chapter 8, which is called Manifest Destiny, are Frederick Lander, uh, who I expect you haven't heard of, but was one of the great figures in 19th century America, should have been president uh, had he not died in in the Civil War, I guess I'm giving a little bit away there, but he's just an extraordinary man. And then Albert Bierstadt, <coughs> uh, son of immigrants from Prussia, uh, the son of a barrel maker in New Bedford, who shocked his parents one day by coming home and saying, I want to be an artist. They said, oh no, you have no talent. <laughs> and he said, but I'm going to do this, and what's more, I'm going to make a huge success out of it. Uh, and the two of them came together in 1859, in really an extraordinary moment when Lander, who was one of the great surveyors of the American West, and we all know Lewis and Clark, but there were a number of groups that were going out trying to create roads into the new possessions of the United States. That was really Lander's business, was uh, surveying. And he was trying to come up with what was known as the Honey Lake Road, which was supposed to go up into Oregon Territory. And he was back in, the United, in Washington in 1858, uh, and to, after a very successful whole surveying trip, which he brought in rather shockingly under budget and oh, an understandable, he got it done before he was supposed to, which was remarkable on then, and as remarkable as it would be now for somebody to do that on a government contract. And as a matter of fact, one paper reported that it should be emblazoned in the walls of Congress the gold letters of the achievement of Colonel Lander. Uh, we could use that example right now. Um, but it really teed off the wrong, uh, well, the wrong people, including his predecessor, a man named William McGraw, who tried to kill him in the Willard Hotel one night by hitting him over the head with a sort of slingshot with his lead attached to leather, and he was trying to kill Lander because he didn't think McGraw looked so bad. Lander was a huge guy. Uh, he was known as Old Grizzly because he had once wrestled to kill a grizzly bear, and all McGraw did was make him mad. So he basically was in the act of beating the world death, and waiters from the weather dragged him off. Uh, but it was clear he needed to go west again and get, get out of Washington. Meanwhile, uh, this artist, Albert Beardshop, had been largely self-taught uh, because his parents really weren't interested 
in his taking this up as a career. And he had gone back to Europe, to Dusseldorf, to train, where he worked with the great painter, uh, also German immigrant painter, Emanuel Leutz, who was then working on uh, his Washington Cross in Delaware, an enormously successful painting from 1852, which showed the great moment 75 years earlier where Washington had crossed on Christmas Day, surprised uh, the Russians at Trenton, and really turned the tide of the Civil War. And this painting, I mean, it was a real sort of balancing act for me, whether I was going to do the, the beard shot or the Lloyds. The Lloyds plays a very strong role in the chapter because it really was a turning point for American art, where you have an American subject being treated with all of the dignity and majesty of a traditional history or religious painting. And Lloyds did start this picture in 1848, which, as you may know, is one of the great revolutionary years in European politics. And he did it because he, it, he actually wrote this down, which is helpful. He said, I want the Europeans to follow the American example. So for the first time, you have somebody trying to promote democracy in Europe based on the example of the colonies. Um, and now that was not a huge success, but the painting was. Now, uh, White's actually did two versions of it, as you may know. Uh, this is the surviving one that um, came to New York, was exhibited to great fanfare. People bought tickets. We have a wonderful account of the young Henry James being taken to see it so he could learn about Washington. And he sort of waxed poetic about feeling that he was there. He could feel the ice and he could, uh, the attention of the moment. But as you look at the painting, it really is nothing of the sort. Uh, if you think about what that was like to cross the Delaware on Christmas night of 1776, it sure didn't look like this. I mean, it was a real act of subterfuge, and some would say, British certainly would say, still luxury, uh, that Washington had pulled off that night. But what Lois creates is this image of inevitable triumph, in which Washington is this heroic, majestic figure who certainly, if he was standing in that little robe, it would fall off. But, you don't, you don't think, I mean, looking at it, you accept this because the construction of it is so compelling. And you know how this story ends, so this is an absolutely appropriate uh, interpretation of the triumph of, of Washington, which becomes the triumph of democracy in the United States. And uh, Beerstadt is, is very, very aware of this. He's then also enormously aware of the success of this painting, the commercial success, and its celebrity. And it's enormous. It, uh, we all have some context pictures of it in a moment, so you see how big it is. Uh, it's, all of these things strongly impressed Beardshot, and uh, he, Lloyds became very much his mentor. So in, this, in the late winter of 1859, uh, Lloyds actually introduces Beardshot to Lander, and Lander says this is fantastic because they're very well trained by Lloyds. In addition, Beerschot was a pioneering photographer, and Lander invited him to go on his 1859 expedition west to do this Honey Lake Road, and Beerschot accepts. So they take the train out to St. Joe's, Mississippi, which as you may know is the jumping off point for the Pony Express, and from there, they went forward on the prairie schooners, and this is a Beerschot from the train. Uh, showing one of their wagons, so this is how they proceeded west. And they get all the way to Wyoming Territory, and there's a wonderful evening on July 3rd, 1859, and they're there with uh, Chief Washaki and the Shoshone Indians, and the Indians and the Lander Party have a Independence Day celebration, and they amaze each other with their different music and dance styles, and they fire off some, uh, some guns, and it's a, it's a wonderful moment of kind of unity and perhaps we can all get along and get all work together. Now, that turned out absolutely not to be the case. Uh, as you may know, the Civil War was already beginning at this point, and the relationship between the westward, uh, the ex westward explorers and the Native Americans was not going to turn out to be a wonderful utopian ideal. But the trip for Beardshot was an enormous success. He took many of the photographs, he did wonderful sketches of the Shoshone, and he had a very strong uh, belief in the subject matter that he was going to be, uh, be exploiting when he got back home, that this was going to be the new art of America, that it 
frame this extraordinary landscape, which is, he kept saying, these mountains dwarf the Alps. It's, it's, this is something that no one's seen before. But he was going to have a whole new subject matter that would commemorate uh, the New Republic. Now, as I said, unfortunately, uh, and we'll get back to this painting in just a moment, uh, it, events intervened, and Lander was made a general and sent out to Virginia by uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and actually, it's Lloyd's and uh, Gerdschot go and visit Lander in the field, and this is one of This is why I should never dabble in any kind of effects, because I am not a master. This is a beer shot picture of the sharpshooters uh, in Virginia, taken from life, and it was one of his more powerful pictures. And then, as the war goes on, Lander, very unfortunately, is wounded at the Battle of Ball's Bluff, and, and that's in October of 62. And he, won, he actually dies the following February. We then have, in November of 63, of course, the Gettysburg Address, that's what was just there. <laughs> and in April of 64, this picture is down here, what that was, was the so-called Metropolitan Sanitary Fair, which was a uh, fundraiser for Union Hospitals. And both the Lloyds and the Beardstock were exhibited at that in New York in April of 64. So in a way, they became part of the uh, of the war effort. But, and then, of course, uh, Lincoln is assassinated the following year. But Gershaw isn't around to uh, witness any of those events because he was already on his way west for his second trip. But just to finish up talking about this picture for a moment that he produces in 62, uh, right after he hears about Lander's death. He is back, Beardshot's back in his New York studio at this point, uh, surrounded by all the sort of flotsam and jetsam from the trip. Uh, and he brought back objects as well as, as, as pictures and sketches. And he had a giant canvas, but he hadn't started his great Western picture yet. But when he heard about Nander's death, he does this basically as a tribute to him. And it, the picture has been criticized as basically a giant photograph that Beardshot simply painted what he saw. He used mechanical reproductions to create his images, and for that reason, they're not really art, not really fine art. They're really more of just a, a reproductive uh, vehicle. But the amazing thing about this picture is, of course, it's nothing of the sort. This is a pastiche. Uh, Beardshot has created it artificially out of different pieces uh, of landscape to create this kind of utopian image, uh, which really is based on classical landscape, uh, the classical landscape tradition of Claude and Roussin, where you have a waterway that leads you back from distinct middle, uh, four middle and background, culminating in a great vertical object, which in this case is a specific mountain in Wyoming, which Beershot actually let the entity and lobby Congress have called Lander's Peak, uh, that he wanted it to actually be a permanent monument to his, his mentor. In the foreground, we have a highly idyllic version of the Shoshone Indians, again, very much based on his observations from life. But as you get into the picture, uh, I strongly recommend you go to the map and see it. I mean, this, this is a, a highly utopian, perfected Shoshone encampment, uh, not I think, the way things actually would have been. Uh, and so what you wind up with here is a vision of what the West can be. And for Lander, as for Beershop, this was not, as you might find in, say, the Hudson River School, a perfect utopia that should be preserved. They saw this as very much a resource to be developed, that this is what the settlers were going to come and experience, and then this would be domesticated and used to propel the United States into uh, its, its next century. And this was, of course, very much Abraham Lincoln's vision as well. Uh, when he gave the Gettysburg Address, this was in many ways a radical statement, which is hard for us to see today. I mean, think about those, those very profound words, and they're an affirmation of what we know happened after. But if you think about it, when Lincoln said four score seven years ago, I mean, that's not a very long period of time. And what he was confronting as president of the United 
United States was a very significant question of democracy. Was it a good idea, given what had been experienced in the Civil War, should this experiment be continued? Now, Lincoln very uh, stalwartly said, yes, this experiment is going to work. We are going to move forward. He, uh, in his vision of the country, very much thought this westward expansion was going to be the preservation, the salvation of the country. Uh, but it was very much a moment in question. And so as we pivot now to talk about democracy promotion, I think remembering that much more perilous moment for the United States, what the reality was of our democracy at that moment, can help us as we think about these issues today. Uh, and that was one of also the great lessons for me about writing the book, is that democracy comes in many different shapes and sizes. Uh, it, it, some that are, I mean, the interesting thing about Athens being the paradigmatic original democracy is it, it fails within 100 years. So that's not something, I mean, why did somebody want to imitate that is always an interesting question. You know, the longest lasting one, Venice, in thousand years, is an oligarchy. Is that a better solution? We don't know. I mean, the French example, as I said, is, is a difficult one because they, they keep trying. Um, <laughs> there's a reason there's no problem. Uh, so, so these, I think, are, are, I think it's a very important historical context to inform how we look at things today, because there is, I mean, it would be wonderful were it, if it were true, but almost a compulsion to see progress toward democracy as an evolutionary, as a linear progress, a linear, linear rather, progress. And an inevitable one. But we, what we see is that's not so. And if you think about the period since the Civil War, you have the First World War, you have the establishment of the Weimar Republic, a disaster. You have the Second World War. And here's a much more hopeful tale, because as Mike and I were discussing at lunch, you know, 70 years ago, we had been sitting here, and I had said, in 2016, three of our greatest good democratic allies are going to be Germany, Japan, and Israel. I mean, you would have laughed me out of the room, and rightfully so, because they two were dead the enemies, one barely existed. You know, the idea that they would be great democratic partners in the United States, laughable, but it came to be, and that's fantastic. But then we have the events of the last 10 years, which I think were very heavily informed by the end of the Cold War, what happened in Eastern Europe. I think this did encourage a, a sense that we had come to be what was called the end of history, the inevitable triumph of democracy of the system. With the right, I think, encouragement, you can take what is a disastrous situation circling the drain and have a reasonable uh, hope of success of establishing a democracy. A place I would not spend a great deal of time pushing that particular agenda would be Egypt, uh, which has its own issues of stability and is kind of working its own way into a more free society, but it's not going to be, it's not going to turn into Virginia tomorrow. Uh, and if you insist that the only way you will work with Egypt is if, if it turns into Virginia, then you're going you're gonna to run into some real problems. So what we're working on is trying to find, a, but I, I, don't, I don't like to think about it as the middle ground. I like to think of it as the third point on a triangle. It's a different approach in which the United States remains an aspirational nation, willing to help those who would like to uh, move toward a system of government similar to ours, always standing up for people who are, are pushing for freedom, fighting for freedom, suffering for freedom. There's certainly enough of them around the globe. But at the same time, not making it our prime directive to impose uh, a Jeffersonian democracy internationally. So that's, that has been my, uh, my trajectory here. And what it, I really wanted to do is have this be more of a discussion than a lecture. I know a lot of you come from a variety of different perspectives. So I think Mike is going to help me out here, but I'm happy to answer or dodge the 